Gabriela Lima Lichtenstein. Um, Gabriela did her PhD in Brazil at Sao Paulo, and she's been working with Gustavo Bergman, who was her advisor, and she is, will be telling us about the distribution of displaced vertices from the heating flue. So well, one more thing to add um, is Gabriela will join UNSW as soon as the borders open again, I hope, and I hope that will be soon. So please, Gabriela. Um, okay, hi to you all. Uh, as Mika said, uh, hopefully I will join you. Uh, would like that very much. Although it's nice to stay home a little <laughs> longer. And today I'm presenting uh, this work I did with my advisor, just finished my PhD. And it's about uh, distribution of displaced vertices from a hidden glue. Okay. Now, can you see my full screen? Uh, is it okay? Yes, yeah. Yes. Good. So I'll start with the beginning with the standard model particle physics. Uh, it's a very su successful theory describing uh, the three generations of matters with fermions of quarks and divided between quarks and leptons, uh, the gauge bosons and the Higgs. Now the symmetry uh, is described by this uh, SC3 cross SC2 cross U1 and can be divided into the strong sector and the electroweak sector. The electroweak uh, is spontaneously broken by the Higgs mechanism into U1 electromagnetic. Okay, just a reminder. Now, I would also like to point a few things on the color sector that may be interest that will be really interesting further in this presentation. So, the quantum chromodynamics comes from uh, this description of the uh, SC3 color group. And its most interesting characteristic is the confinement. So we want to describe the dynamics of quarks and gluons. And however, we can never uh, really observe a free quark in nature. It's always confined into a hadron. So when we want to describe a process with a parton, that means a quark or a gluon, we can uh, use uh, the, the this uh, color group and describe the interaction and so on. However, when we calculate, for example, a cross section, we need to evolve it to a hadronic level to compare with the data. So the most acceptable uh, model to describe this hadronization is through these color strings. So if we have, for example, uh, these uh, hadron or meson, with uh, two quarks, it would we could uh, describe this interaction as this uh, color string, and when they are uh, close to each other, they are low in energy energetically. Uh, they would wouldn't feel uh, the force that of the interaction uh, that strong, and if we increase the energy and we try to pull them apart, the string would be the, the string tension would increase up to the point when we have energy enough to create uh, a new pair of quarks and have uh, multiple uh, hadrons. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. And another, just another point to remind you that uh, all of these. Uh, all of these uh, color, uh, <laughs> sorry, all of these color interactions, they they depend on the, of course, on the strong coupling, which depends on the, the energy. So we can also calculate the running that gives us this confinement. Sorry, we can calculate this running that would give us uh, the dependence of the the strong 
coupling to the energy with the QCD beta function that is calculated uh, with uh, quantum corrections. Okay. So going beyond the standard model, of course, there are uh, many open questions, many interesting things to, to, to study. But in this work, we're focusing on the hard problem of scales, which is uh, the main motivation to look for new physics at the TEV scale at the LHC. So this question concerns the sensitivity uh, the theory has to the UV scale. That means the, the scale up to which the standard model is valid. So for instance, if we calculate the Higgs the, the, correct, the radiative corrections to the Higgs mass, we need to include contributions from this fermionic loop. And the diagram that contributes the most is this, this one that is represented here in the right, uh, with a top loop. We need to, of course, we need to include all the fermions, but the top is the one that contributes the most because of its UCAL, it's near U1. And then we see that this, this correction to the Higgs mass diverges quadratically with the UV, with the UV scale. And the UV scale is in principle not bounded. It could go up to the mass of Planck. And that's 10 to the 17 orders difference from electroweak scale. And this does not agree with the fact that we find a uh, light Higgs of uh, 125 GeVs. So this is an indication that this UV scale should be near the TV, the TV scale, or we have fine tuning. Okay, so one of the candidates to solve the hierarchy problem is to use supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is described with this algebra of operators, of this charge operators Q, that would transform a fermionic state to a bosonic and vice versa. The minimum extension, supersymmetric extension to this standard model is called MSSM, proposes that every standard model particle would have a superpartner with a different uh, speed. So, for example, the quark would have a scalar uh, partner that is quark, and the top would have the partner that's called stop. And the, if we go back and we analyze the sensitivity uh, of the UV scale with the hierarchy problem with the mass of the Higgs, we see that now the contribution of this top loop would be cancelled by the contribution of the stop that is a scalar and would have a different sign uh, of, the, of the loop and cancel each other. So the MSSM is supposedly to be a natural theory. And this is, was a big motivation to look for supersymmetry at the LHC. However, we already gathered a lot of data and the bounds with the LHC now put the stop mass near the TV scale. So with the data we have now, we, show that we see that the MSSM itself needs fine tuning. And we create a new problem that's called a little hierarchy problem concerning the already existing gap between the electroweak scale and the LHC operating scale. Uh, here on the right is actually a TASI t-shirt where, as we can see, data is, is gaining from a theory right now and the, the LHC bounds are putting very strict restrictions to BSM physics. Uh, but at least we're still standing up, right? Um, Okay, so one alternative to the little hierarchy problem is to propose a hidden sector. That is, a, some, so we have a, a family of models that could preserve some of the good 
qualities of the theories that are candidate to solve the hierarchy problem. However, they would have a new phenomenology to escape those bounds of the LHC. So they are not easily detected. One of them is a family of models called neutral naturalness. In these scenarios, uh, we have the color group and an exact copy of it. So we would have another QCD, something that works very similarly. But the two S3 groups, they, they do not interact with each other. So we, we wouldn't have a strong production at the LHC that could uh, escape some of the bounds. So neutral naturalness has uh, uh, several different re realizations, including folded supersymmetry, twin Higgs, that probably the, the most uh, aborted in the literature, and quirky little Higgs. And there are theories that do have a, a hidden glue, but they are cousins to neutral naturalness, such as a hidden valley. So in this work, uh, we show you the results uh, focusing on a folded supersymmetry realization of a neutral naturalness. So neutral naturalness in general, we would have two copies of the SU3 color group, A and B, linked by the Z2 parity. And we remain uh, the, the electroweak sector uh, is, isn't much, it's just the, the st standard model. So one interesting thing for the supersymmetry is that we would have a colorless top quark partner. So the spectrum has this scalar top that preserves the qualities, the good things about supersymmetry However, it would be charged under the SU3B, under the hidden sector color, and not the usual standard model. So it wouldn't be highly produced at the LHC. But it solves the, the hierarchy problem uh, in a similar way of the MSS. Now, the way to achieve this theory with this spectrum is to UV complete it with a supersymmetric theory in five dimensions. So what we're looking for is to have above the electroweak, set, the electroweak scale uh, a spectrum containing the standard model and the folded uh, partners. So they're not supersymmetrical partners, but they look like it and they are charged under the hidden color. And then <clears throat> at, the light, at the slightly higher scale, typically from 5 to 15 TeVs, we could restore supersymmetry. And the way to do that uh, is to, the way to go back from supersymmetry to the folded SUSY is to break it by boundary conditions in the Scherk-Schwarz mechanism. Let me explain that a little better. So the UV uh, theory would be a supersymmetry in a compact extra dimension, which is described in an Orbi fold. This topology is typically uh, this segment of size pi r and two fixed points at each, at each edge. So there is a fixed point uh, at y equals zero, y is the, the extra dimension and another fixed point at the other edge of pi r, where r is the size of the extra dimension. Um, the minimum matter content for a supersymmetry with five dimensions is equivalent to an n equals two supersymmetry. That means that the quark hypermultiplet now contains the equivalent of two pairs of a quark and a spark. So it would be analogous to have the double, to have a supersymmetry and doubled with, with two, two times the flavor or something. 
Uh, okay, flavor confused now, so just two pairs. Uh, okay, and we select the spectrum we want and we break the supersymmetry using this Shirk Schwartz mechanism. That, so we choose uh, different boundary conditions, different theories in each of the fixed points of the orbifold. We also choose this SU2R symmetry that links all the points of the orbifold and an invariance under this uh, Z2 parity that helps us to select the spectrum. After the break, we want a theory that has the two SU3 color groups and the Z2 symmetry. And uh, when, we, when we integrate out the extra dimension, we obtain a four-dimensional theory that is not supersymmetrical, but it has quarks charged under the A group that we can identify as the standard model. And these quarks are identified as the B group, which is the hidden sector. Now, since they come from the same hypermultiplet, they, they have this uh, remaining uh, symmetry that helps us um, maintain the naturalness from the SUSY, but they are not super partners and they do not interact strongly. So just to sum up, we, um, sorry, uh, I hate it. So we started with a hypermultiplet that would have two uh, copies of quarks and squarks. And when we choose the boundary conditions, we choose it such that the odd states under disparity are integrated out. So we choose the boundary conditions to remain the quarks from standard model and the scalars from charge under the hidden sector color, and we eliminate the stop, and we eliminate the quarks from the B set. So we eliminate half of the spectrum out. Gabi, can I have a question for clarification with that? Yes, yeah, this is very complicated, please. Uh, no, no. Uh, so what is, what is the five dimensional gauge group of color? Um, is that SO6 or something like that? Why, why is that? Uh, that I, think uh, one, I think one possible uh, realization is an SU6. Yeah, it should be. Otherwise, you know, hypermultiplet can, cannot have two uh, split in two different groups because of. Mm, then we can. Group. Yeah, sure. The, the, uh, the, the initial paper of uh, Fode Suzy, I believe they, they did a, an example with an SU6. Uh, that breaks into two different SU3s. Okay. So this is a possibility, yeah. But it, I think it could be more general than this and still be folded to SUSY, but I, I don't know if there are other models uh, similar. But uh, SU6 to, to SU3 is it's, it's what they do in the, in the original paper. Right. Okay. Okay, can I move on? Oh yes, please, sorry. <laughs> okay, good. Now, let's go back to phenomenology, right? So, um, one of the signals at the LHC that would characterize uh, those neutral naturalness uh, models is to look for displaced vertices coming from this hidden group. So uh, we're focusing here uh, on showing you how the folded SUSY uh, squarks can lead to uh, displaced vertices. However, uh, I showed you before that, that this is a family of models and we can generalize it to different 
hidden glue scenarios. Okay. So let's think of, uh, of the phenomenology of these folded quarks. They, in this scenario, we can produce at the LHC uh, a pair of folded quarks with this uh, with a an electroweak neutral current. And in case they are produced, they would be produced back to back very energetically. And since they do not interact strongly with the standard model, the most likely thing for these quarks to do is actually to go back and annihilate each other into folded gluons. These folded gluons hadronize. And the lightest state they can hadronize into are globals. So globals are hadrons are objects made out of pure glue, and they are predicted out, they are predicted from QCD. Uh, however, these globals now they are charged under the hidden sector, so they wouldn't be detected. Now, the first paper considering uh, this hidden sector phenomenology, which is this one in 2008 here, they thought that the globals would be, uh, would show up as missing energy at the detector. However, there was a couple of papers, 2015, considering this interaction of the, of the hidden glue with the Higgs through a high dimensional operator. And when we consider this case, we see that it is possible that the global will decay while still inside the detector, producing the displaced vertices. So the point of this work was to calculate the distribution of displaced vertices where in the, det the detector would it be likely to decay. All right. So before we start with the cross-section and the hadronization process, we need to understand how to model this hidden sector strong coupling. So it would look like this QCD strong coupling with a, a few uh, differences. Uh, first, we have this initial boundary condition that is given at a UV scale. So the, at this UV scale, we want to restore supersymmetry and we impose that the standard model uh, strong coupling should be the same of the folded coupling, of the hidden sector coupling. And we can evolve it to lighter, uh, to lower energy scales using a scalar beta function. This beta function depends on the number of scalars we have in the theory. So we evolve this uh, up to the mass of the quark. Now the mass of the folded quarks are calculated at one loop. And there is a, a difference between the left and the right-handed masses because of the SU2 uh, gauge interactions. So we would have this uh, difference between the two masses. And to sum up, we would uh, use this boundary condition of the UV, evolve the beta, the, the coupling with the B scalar beta function up to the mass of the left quark, then integrate half of the spectrum out, evolve it to the right-handed quark mass, integrate the rest of it, and then we could go to the confinement scale, the infrared scale, okay? So once we can estimate the hidden sector strong uh, coupling, and we can estimate this infrared, this infrared scale. We can also estimate the mass of the global that's uh, given by uh, QCD and lattice QCD 
properties. And we know that the mass of the global should be approximately seven times of the infrared confinement scale. Now, if you remember, we have the boundary conditions at the UV scale where we restore supersymmetry. And we also depend, this, this, this coupling also depends on the mass of the quarks. So here in the, the plot, we have uh, the UV scale set to five to 10 TVs. And the mass of the quarks from approximately 400 to a TV, 400 GV to a TV scale. And we see that we obtain a relatively light global from 10 to 20, 10 to 20 GVs. Okay, uh, so back to the production of the folded quarks. Uh, so first we calculate the partonic level cross section. That is relatively simple. We just need to calculate a, a scalar cross section. We could use uh, fine rules and math graph for these and obtain uh, these typically electroweak cross section. Now the hadronization process: how to go from the cross sec partonic level cross section to the hadronic is could be made uh, by use of a fragmentation function. So if we integrate this cross section with the fragmentation function D that is in red, uh, we obtain the hadronic cross section. And that's how it's usually done. Uh, I forgot to write here uh, Z, this uh, variable Z that I think the other three uh, equations here is the energy of the hadron divided by the energy of the parton. So it's a variable that goes from zero to one. And we can model this fragmentation function. Uh, the way it's usually done in QCD is that they measure, they measure it at a certain, at a certain uh, energy level and then we can use this DGLAP evolution to predict it at uh, a different energy, which is the, this uh, last equation with a mu here. I uh, forgot to talk about it, but uh, we also have a, a normalization for the fragmentation function. And its integral is actually gives us the average multiplicity. So how many hadrons we produce from this pattern. Which is, uh, so what we are looking for here is, is actually the multiplicity because we look for uh, the distribution of displaced vertices. We want to model uh, how many globals we would produce from each gluon. And also uh, another point here is that when we do the Diglop evolution, it depends on this uh, gluon splitting function. Uh, we are only going from gluons to globals here, so it's actually more simple than it's what is written here. So the gluon splitting function is this, uh, in the last equation here, uh, the P of W in red, that's the gluon splitting function. So we need to integrate the fragmentation function and the splitting function to obtain uh, the evolution. So the gluon splitting function, uh, we can get it from the literature. Uh, it's uh, calculated in terms of this expansion in uh, logs of uh, the, the alpha that is the, the strong coupling. And here uh, I show you the, the, the result for zero order gluon splitting function. However, uh, this these diverges for uh, low z when, when z goes to zero. So we need to use a different uh, parameterization, a low z approximation when we go for, 
when the when z is uh, sorry when z is goes to zero. So we usually we fix this matching point for the low z approximation, which is set by this expression here alpha times log squared of one over z going to one. That's our approximately our matching point for the the approximation. Okay, finally, we can uh, model the hadronization of the hidden gluons to gluables. So usually the fragmentation function, it has this um, form of a normalization times one minus z times beta. So we have this power of beta. And we need a boundary condition to fix it at the lower energy. So one educated guess is to put beta to zero. That is a fragmentation function from a pion and, and uh, it's a, it has a Q, it has QCD uh, rules that uh, <laughs> would be similar to what we want here with the gluons. However, this is a, just a, a guess. It's, it could be uh, more precise than that. And we have to fix the matching point and then do the de Glapp evolution. Our first attempt was to do the de Glapp evolution numerically. However, we found um, many numerical uh, implications and was not working out that well. So we figured a, a different strategy to attack it, which is that we saw that even uh, for the initial condition, the average number of globals were given, uh, were dominated by this low Z behavior. So we could use uh, this expression for the average multiplicity that is already calculated for a given energy mu. So it, it has already been treated to, with the DGLAP evolution. Uh, this can be found easily on textbooks. This was from a Alice textbook, QCD book. And it would uh, fix for us the average number of globals at a certain energy. And then we could go back to the fragmentation function and stipulate the value of beta for different values. And this way uh, we modeled the fragmentation function and have this result for varying the mass of the squark from 300 to 900 GVs. So 300 would be the red line uh, on the bottom and the 900 is the purple one that is the peak, the highest peak. We used in these, uh, in these result here, we use the matching point for the low Z behavior at point one the mass of the global at 15 GVs and the UV scale where we restart Suzy at, <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot see it. I think it's seven GVs. Uh, so the interesting thing of the DGLAP evolution is that when we increase the energy, it actually, uh, the, the fragmentation function is more localized to a low Z behavior. Okay. Okay, so now that we uh, modeled the, the, this hadronization process to find the, we want to find out um, how, how long would this global fly, right? So we need the average uh, mean lifetime uh, for the hidden global. So we can get this from these two uh, references uh, that the, these hidden gluons could, uh, could interact with the Higgs through this higher order of operator. And then we calculate the, the width of globals going back to the standard model which depends on this f of g in red. That is the global decay constant calculated on lattice. 
and it also depends on the mass of the global. So overall, this result of the global width, it would vary with the mass of the global to the seventh power, which is interesting because as we show later on the results, they are very sensitive to the mass of the global. And finally, <laughs> our results is the distribution of displaced vertices. So if you remember, I said that when we integrate the fragmentation function, it gives us the average multiplicity of globals produced per global, so it's per side of the detector. And we uh, multiply it with this Poissonic, uh, with this Poissonic probability of the globals decaying at a certain length L. And L is divided by LG that is set by the mean lifetime, so by the width. Okay, so this is a result for a relatively light global of 15 GV. Uh, we have fixed uh, the lambda UV to 70 EVs, and we have results for the mass of the squarks from 300 to 700 GVs. Now, this plot here gives us uh, the number of displaced vertices coming from the, uh, the average multiplicity we have. In terms of the decay length, where L is given in meters here. So we plot it and we have these uh, horizontal dashed lines, which is the maximum average multiplicity we could have at 300, 500, 700 GVs for the mass of the squark. So you see clearly here in the orange line that it, it reaches its maximum at uh, near 10 meters. So it could decay still inside the detector. And the horizontal uh, dashed lines, we plotted uh, an estimative for uh, uh, an LHC detector. I think it was Atlas, yes, for Atlas detector, where the first part from zero to approximately one, one and a half meters would be uh, when the displaced vertices is inside the inner inner tracker. Then the second part is the electronic calorimeter from two to four, more or less here we have a, a hadronic calorimeter and up to 10 meters we would have a, a muon chamber. So experimentally it's, uh, the analysis would be very different for, for each part of the detector, right? So it would be interesting to predict uh, where we should look for these, uh, these displaced vertices. Now for uh, the light global 15, we see that the, the orange line, which is the lightest uh, squark at 300, it would decay while it's still inside the detector, more likely in the immune chamber, maybe there's some part uh, maybe one displaced vertices at the calorimeters. However, the very uh, energetic blue balls, they probably fly over the detector and would be missing energy. Now, as I said before, uh, the mean lifetime was very, would vary with the mass up to the seventh power of the blue ball. So these results are very sensitive to this parameter. And if we increase the mass of the global to 20 GVs, there's already a very different result where a light spark could decay anywhere in the detector and have multiple um, displaced vertices. And the more energetic uh, globals with the mass of the square 500 and 700 already have uh, some probability of decaying inside the, de the detector. 
And if we go for 30 GVs, we see the, this great uh, result where we have multiple displaced vertices anywhere in the detector. Okay, so uh, to conclude, we showed you uh, these hidden glue scenarios as a solution to the little hierarchy problem. And one um, signature that would characterize these scenarios is the displaced vertices coming from this hidden glue. Specifically, we did these calculations in the folded supersymmetry realization. However, these uh, hadronization, the, the fragmentation function can be generalized to, to the other scenarios too. And the results we have, they are very sensitive to the global mass. And we show that we can have at the LHC multiple events anywhere in the detector. So it would be interesting now for the future to have a more precise simulation, especially for the high luminosity LH LHC, uh, to predict uh, how to look for those displaced vertices. This is not an easy task for the experimentalist. Uh, so it would be interesting to, to show them uh, <laughs> where to look for them. Uh, also, we have the, that educated guess for the fragmentation function at, uh, with the initial condition. And I know there is a, another group that were doing some uh, parton shower simulations on the hidden glue, which could, could give us uh, an initial condition that would be more accurate. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I wish I could give this seminar there and work with you, start working with you soon, but <laughs> that's what was possible here. Uh, I'm glad to, to share this with you and anyway. Thank you very much, Gavi, for a nice talk. So we have now time for questions. Oh, yeah, so I think Ray is raising his hand. Yeah, so um, what, what would be um, the decay products uh, coming from these hidden glue balls? You showed, I think, an effective operator, which was uh, H dagger H and then, uh, and then G squared. Um, so what are the other possibilities? What would, what would the uh, experiments so actually look for? The global would could interact through the Higgs. That's uh, the only possibility inside the, while inside the detector. And the most likely uh, is, uh, I think it was Higgs to, to B mesons. So it, we would have a, a jets. Is that answers? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, can, can I ask a question? So, so, yeah. there is, um, so you have that coupling to the Higgs. W would you change Higgs properties like Higgs? But you should also have Higgs decaying to blue balls. Or is that very much suppressed? That would be invisible. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. But, but, but there so, are constraints on invisible Higgs decays. That's invisible. Uh, that puts bounds on on, a, on the theories though. I remember that for the twin Higgs specifically, uh, we have two, let me see. We have uh, two scales, we have F and V, V is the, the standard model scale and F was the, the twin the twin symmetry breaking scale, I guess. Uh, okay, uh, I, I'm not really thinking on twin Higgs now, but I remember there were there were strictly bounds on these F and Vs of the twin Higgs coming from invisible uh, Higgs decays. So that that could put bounds on on the theories mm -hmm. uh, on how how much they could interact with the Higgs. Okay, I get it. Thanks. That makes sense. Thank you.
Do we have other questions? Yeah, Bruce. Hi, so first of all, thank you very much Hi. for the talk. Um, I, I had a question about the, the decay mechanisms you have in mind. In a very early talk, in a very early slide, you showed production of a pair of these um, folded squarks from, mm. a, from a photon, yeah, or a Z. And, and so I'm just trying to understand, this is the, is this the fundamental mechanism for, for production and propagation of these things in the detector that you have in mind or just an example? Um, so those folded quarks for start, uh, they, they cannot be strongly produced. That's yep. the whole thing, right? We, no, we that's clear. Found but they can be uh, charged so in this in this scenario specifically they are charged under electroweak uh, gauge uh, couplings so they could be produced with a w or a z for example uh, we have bound we do have bounds on the quark masses from a different paper with uh, gustavo too and uh, there was a previous paper with Gustavo where there are bounds on these uh, production with a W. Uh, however, the signal uh, this production would pro would uh, would have uh, is not does not characterize uh, this specific scenario. It, it was, I think, uh, some some W resonances. I don't remember quite well right now, but the signal was. Uh, if we have this the new physics signal, it would characterize a, tons of different models and it would be different to tell if it was from a hidden sector. So this one is more interesting because it gives us these uh, displaced vertices uh, that we don't usually find in other theories. So, uh, you, so but this this diagram, as you explained it, foresees okay. a kind of a very pure example of uh, of the Lund string model, right? In the folded sector, yeah. that you that you produce these things, they propagate, they stretch out all the way, mm -hmm. and eventually they come back together and produce all of this stuff. Um, yes. But and, what and about the? But that. That assumes that at no point does the string break. Um, so that seems to be a quite non-trivial assumption about how the fragmentation works. Did I miss a detail uh, about that? What, what, no. what stops this from, from fragmenting in the, you know, within the, within the hidden SU3? the way that a pair of quarks would do, a quark anti-quark pair would do if you produce them in this uh, way? They, they are heavy, right? They, yep. I don't think that, uh, that's too... They, they is could the point be, that the lightest folded squark is too heavy to produce by string breaking? Is that the... No, they're very heavy. And what they could do is to produce a bound state. And however, they, there, are, there are some calculations in this uh, paper here, 085 with, the, with Gustavo Chaco and uh, Ronnie. And they have some calculations and the mean lifetime of this bound state is irrelevant for the collider usual times. So we do not consider the bound state and they are very heavy so they're not going to fragmentate into something else and they also not charge in the, the strong standard models so they could not. No, no, that part's clear. Yeah. That, 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 that part I understand. Yeah. I'm just trying to... Pretty much the, the only thing that is left is for them to annihilate. Okay. So, All right, right, that's interesting. 
what is the mass scale of the folded squarks? Is it lambda UV, so you know, multi TV, or is it lower? Uh, okay, the, the mass of the squarks uh, from these uh, from the charge current uh, bounds we have, they need to be heavier than I think uh, 300, 400 GVs. And the lambda UV scale, uh, as I told you before, it shouldn't be much heavier than 10 TVs uh, because these, uh, these quarks are not protected. So we cannot have uh, the folded supersymmetry and even the Higgs mass, it has this log divergence. It, it, it cannot be to, it cannot lead to higher yeah, and uh, are the masses of the folded squarks always of the same order as the UV scale, or are they, or are they, or can they be lighter? They can be lighter, but they cannot be lighter than the, I think four hundred GBs because then we have bounds from the yep yep uh, electron. But they can be lighter than the UV scale. Yeah. Are, are there any other exotics or other things which are light? Or is it just those? More things? Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I'm just asking. I'm just wondering. So the model has basically just extended SU3 color to SU3 cross SU3. So you're just doubling more or less your core content. Hey, so there are no mesons, you know, the pions and things like that. Uh, in your model. It would be no, heavier than the blue ball. Right, right. So uh, the <laughs> is heavily broken in that sector. Yeah. The blue ball is not that heavy, right? So I guess the, the question is how, how light might might one of the pion equivalents be? Yeah, no, I, I never, I didn't go for the pions. I don't know. But, uh, but the squawks are all heavy, right? And, and, and yeah, the, I think and the chiral symmetry is broken very, you know, significantly. So the pions are yeah. very heavy. That's what you assume, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Otherwise, yeah, I think we. I think this is a question from a, Sita. Very nice talk. Um, ah, sorry. sorry. In the in the chat room. See, but do you want to ask the question, unmute the mic and ask yourself, or you can read it? Yeah, so what I need to say is that, I mean, I mean, there, I mean, I, I, I really, I'm not very up to date with all these bounds and so and so, but I have basically three questions. So, so does the, uh, does the, the normal visible sector has any blue ball uh, signature first? Second is that in one of the slides, uh, we saw that, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know about this ultraviolet 7 TV, but what I mean to say that there is an masses of the blue ball which she mentioned around 30 GV or so. So 30 GV, 40 GV still allow have a room for the lighter supersymmetric particle from some n is equal to one supersymmetry. But I mean, uh, how you identify the blue balls displaced vertices from some other sources like uh, like there are many other sources, but one of them is like upright evaluation light like supersymmetry. So, uh, so how you identify that this is my blue balls displaced vertices? Because they're invisible. <laughs> but LSP is also invisible. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. So the I mean the displaced vertex is normally for the normally gen. I mean, yeah. I mean. I mean, even in the lightest supersymmetric particle in the MSSM case, n is equal to one supersymmetry. Even in the lightest supersymmetric particle mass, which is around 30 GV, 40 GV, 50 GV, still allowed from the, the invisible jet width. They have still have the, the some, uh, some, some centimeter displaced vertices. So how you, how you identify that this is my displaced vertices from the blue ball, not from the LSP? First of all, uh, you said centimeters, and these would be much, Sorry, millimeter. much, millimeter. More, millimeter. much highly millimeter. displaced. It would be meters displaced. Yeah, it starts from, the, it, it depends on your GV, from your decay width, which is of the order of m quark to the power 7 by m to the power 4, some value. 
So you can mm. play around those value and you can fit that your displaced decay width is of the order of the electron volt. And then you have the you have your detector length and you can have an you can adjust, you can tune all these parameters. But my question is that how you identify that I have a displaced vertex from the glue wall, not from anything else? What are the characteristics? I don't know really. So the signature is the highly displaced and they are uh, electroweakly produced uh, because the, for example, for a supersymmetry, they would be strongly produced. So the displaced vertices uh, searches that we have now on, on Atlas, on LHCB, no, LHCB already has a hidden value when I, I'm not sure, but on Atlas, we do have displaced vertices searches, but the cross sections are strong cross sections productions. Uh, it, they are much higher. So we don't even have bounds from the, those. So, so, so if I understood correctly, that means that the trigger, the trigger is adjusted such that the electric displaced vertex is removed from the data itself. Yeah. Is that? Yes. The trigger. What was your, the, yeah, trigger, the, trigger. Well, the trigger for the glue walls is different from the electric displaced vertices. Is that? Yeah, the cross section is just too low. Uh, but, but okay, so now let me ask one question. Is there? Uh, we so had another question, right? Wasn't it two of them? 